All right, welcome back. Macro Unit 2, Screencast 1, Building the Aggregate Demand, Aggregate Supply Model, starting with consumption. Little warning, this is a relatively mathematical unit. Um, you might want to have a calculator involved um, to follow along. And um, just in full honesty, it's not really intellectually satisfying until you get it all under your belt and it starts coming together. So right now we're just kind of looking at pieces of things. I'm going to ask you to kind of hold it together as we go. So here's what we know so far. There are three indicators of economic performance. That's what we learned in the last unit, GDP, unemployment, and inflation. And what we're going to be doing in this unit is essentially trying to understand what makes those variables what they are um, first off. And we're going to do that by building a model for how the economy works. Um, once we build the model, we'll have an understanding of the ways that the government tries to manipulate the model to try to make the economy better, make GDP go up, unemployment go down, and inflation stay kind of steady at a low rate. If you remember how we calculate GDP through the expenditures approach, we take all the spending that everyone does, add it together, and get to GDP. And if you keep this formula in mind, it'll keep, help things, uh, keep things straight. So we're going to start out by exploring C, uh, consumption and spending. And we're going to start out there because it's the biggest component of spending. It's 70% of all the spending that happens in the economy. So if you think about what really determines how much money people spend, the answer is their income. We call that disposable income. Disposable means income that they can spend. You can think of it as after-tax income. And the idea is that when you get income, there's two things you can do with it. You can spend it, in which case it becomes consumption, or you can save it, in which case it becomes savings. So all of your money essentially goes to one of those two places. Which brings us to our first formula in this unit, disposable income equals consumption plus savings. Now kind of as a side note, savings is considered a leakage of spending, meaning it's spending that doesn't happen. It's money that you're putting under the mattress or putting into the bank. And we'll talk more about the implications of that later. So some empirical facts about consumption, some things that are just true based on the data historically. First off, households spend most of their disposable income. Secondly, consumption and savings are directly related to disposable income, meaning that the more you earn, the more you spend, consume, and the more you save. And then third, the poor tend to spend a higher percentage of their income than rich people do. If you're a billionaire, it's really hard to spend a billion dollars, and you're probably not going to spend all of it. Poor people tend to spend all of their income, and sometimes even more than their income. And we'll talk about how that's possible in a sec. So that brings us to our first little table, consumption and saving schedules. If you look at the first two columns here, you have what's called a consumption schedule. And what a consumption schedule shows you is, for each level of disposable income, how much money you would spend. So according to this chart, if you made $6,000, you would spend $8,000. If you made $18,000, you would spend $16,000. The first and third columns are collectively or together a savings schedule. And they show you the same thing. For each level of disposable income, how much money you would save. Now notice that as your income goes up, your consumption goes up, as does your savings. And secondly, notice that if you add the consumption and savings numbers together in any row, you're going to get the disposable income number. DI is equal to C plus S. $18,000 is equal to $16,000 plus $2,000. Now I'm keeping that data in the upper left hand corner of the screen um, to show you how it relates to what these things would look like graphically. On the top of the screen I have the consumption schedule graphed out. We have disposable income on the x-axis, consumption on the y-axis, that black 45 degree line that you see is called the break-even line. It's every place in the graph where consumption would be exactly equal to disposable income. In other words, it's every place in the graph where you're spending exactly what you earn. On the bottom of the slide, there is the savings schedule graphed out. And again, disposable income goes on the x-axis and savings goes on the y-axis. And the green lines show you the actual data from the chart plotted out into these graphs. The green line and the green line here are related to one another. 
Notice that at low levels of disposable income, so we're talking right around here, consumption is greater than that black line, meaning you're spending more than your income. And that's what you see over here, spending more than your income, spending more than your income. When you spend more than your income, you go into debt, and that's called dissavings, and you can see that down here, savings that's less than zero. In this chart, at a disposable income of 12000 you spend exactly 12000 That would correspond to this point right here. That's called break-even income, and it happens where the consumption schedule crosses that 45 degree line. Notice that here, savings is equal to zero. At higher levels of income, 18000 or 24000 which might be over here, notice that the green line is underneath the 45 degree line you're not spending as much as your income. And when that's true, you start saving money. So this vertical distance between the black 45 degree line and the C line is equal to the vertical distance between the savings line and the zero over here. When you consume more than you earn, you go into debt, the savings. When you consume less than you earn, you start saving money. So now we're going to start adding some formulas. We're going to start off with what's called the average propensity to consume. Think of this as the percentage of your income that you actually spend. So going back to that same data, if we wanted to figure out your average propensity to consume, or APC, we take the level of consumption and divide it by the level of disposable income. So for example, if we took 12,000 and divided by 12,000, we would get 1. And that's exactly what we get. This 0 0.88 is 16,000 divided by 18,000. In other words, when you are making $18,000, you spend 88% of your income. When you're making $24,000, you spend 83% of your income. Again, going back to what I said a few slides ago, as your income goes up, the percentage of the money that you spend tends to go down. Your APC tends to drop. The next formula we're going to look at is called average propensity to save. Think of this as the percentage of your income that you put in the bank or put under the mattress. And remember, any income you earn is either spent or saved. So back to that same data, here is our average propensity to consume. Average propensity to save is the saving number divided by the disposable income number. So this 0 0.11 is equal to 2,000 divided by 18,000. Now notice if you add these two columns together, APC and APS, they're always equal to one. Again, because there's only two things you could do with your money. So if you earn $18,000 and you're spending 89% of it, you must be saving 11% of it. APC plus APS will always equal one. More important than the average propensities are what are called marginal propensities. And this is our first marginal in macroeconomics. Remember, marginal means change or addition to. The marginal propensity to consume, which is, by the way, the most important little acronym we're going to see today, is equal to the change in consumption divided by the change in disposable income. In other words, if you got a raise, how much of that raise would you go out and spend? To figure out the marginal propensity to consume, again, you take the change in consumption and divide it by the change in disposable income. So let's say you were earning $12,000 and then you got a raise to $18,000. The consumption schedule shows you that you would spend $12,000 initially and then spend $16,000 after the raise. The change in consumption here is $4,000. The change in income was $6,000. So if you take $4,000 and divide it by $6,000, you'll get the marginal propensity to consume. And in this case, it's 0 0.67. Notice that this is constant all the way down, because every time we jump from one level to the next in this disposable income, the change in disposable income is the same, $6,000 every time. The change in consumption is also the same, $4,000 every time. So every single time, we're going to get a fraction that's equal to 0.67. What this means is that if you get a raise, you will spend 67% of that raise. 
the other percentage you will wind up saving. And that is called your marginal propensity to save. It's the change in savings divided by the change in disposable income. So again, going back to these numbers, if I wanted the marginal propensity to save, I would take the change in savings and notice here it's $2,000 every time as you jump from level to level. The change in disposable income is $6,000 every time. So 2,000 divided by 6,000 gives you your marginal propensity to save, which is 0 0.33. Again, notice that if you take marginal propensity to consume and add it to your marginal propensity to save, those numbers also add up to one. Again, there's only two things you can do with your money. So if you get a raise and you spend 67% of your raise, you'll wind up saving 33%. Now, if you think about that consumption schedule again and think about the slope of it, slope is change in y over change in x. Here our y is consumption and our x is disposable income. So change in consumption divided by change in disposable income, that's the slope of this consumption schedule and that's also MPC, right? That's the formula for MPC. Same with the savings schedule. Change in savings divided by the change in disposable income that's the formula for MPS, so MPS is the slope of this savings line. And if you take the slope of these two lines and add them together, that's equal to 1. In other words, if you took this green line and added it to this green line, you would get this black line, the 45 degree line, which has a slope of 1. Again, this is a fancy way graphically of saying that there's two things you can do with your money. If you earn money, you can spend it, or you could save it. So what really determines C is disposable income. And the more income you earn, your uh, consumption and savings change, and you'll move up and down those green lines. Those green lines might also move as a whole. Um, and what causes those green lines to move are called non-income determinants of consumption, things other than income that will change how much you spend or how much you save. The first one, is wealth. Now wealth is different than, than income. Wealth is what you already have. So you can imagine a really rich person who has no job. That would be a wealthy person that has no income. You can imagine a person that makes a lot of money, let's say $100,000, but has no money in the bank. That would be a person with a high income, but no wealth. Well, the idea is that the wealthier you are, the more of your income you spend. Right? You don't have to worry about saving for retirement or saving for college. So as your wealth goes up, your consumption goes up, but your savings tend to go down at every level of income. The second factor that might change where those lines are are expectations. You might have expectations that prices are going to go up in the future, or you might have expectations that there will be shortages of goods in the future. If that's the case, then at every level of income, your consumption will likely go up and your savings would likely go down. The third factor is debt. And the idea is that the more in debt people are, the scare, more scared they are of spending money. So if you have lots of debt, you tend to save more money to try to pay off that debt in the future. The more your debt, the lower your consumption, the higher your savings tend to be. For each of these three determinants, they'll always move consumption in one direction and savings in the opposite direction. The fourth determinant does something a little bit different, taxation. Taxation changes your level of disposable income. So if the government raises taxes on you, what's going to happen is that you'll both consume less and save less. If the government lowers taxes on you, you have more income. You keep more of your income. More of your income becomes disposable income. And so your consumption would go up as well as your savings. So to play that out graphically, let's say that we have a wealth or expectations or debt change in the economy that causes consumption to rise. At every level of income, consumption goes up. But since there's only two things you can do with your income, if consumption's going up, savings must be coming down. Conversely, if these factors cause you to spend less at every level of income, 
you're probably going to be saving more. In fact, you will be saving more. If you earn a certain amount of money and spend less of it, the amount you save automatically goes up. The one that's a little weird, again, is taxes. If the government raises taxes on you, you have less income. And so you wind up spending less, your consumption schedule will drop, and your savings schedule will drop as well. All right, well, I know that's some pretty hardcore, intricate stuff. It's probably going to take you a couple of times going through it and working through the uh, assignments to really fully understand it. But as always, I'm going to ask you to come in with any questions you might have. Done with this screencast.